All right, guys, here we go. So we're going to talk about Bitcoin and why I believe maybe even before the halving in less than three weeks, we could see $92,000 on the price. So stick around if you want to understand why that's a high likelihood. Uh, it's going to be a great video. And you can already see Bitcoin's actually doing pretty good today, up 2%. Um, one thing I want to point out in this chart, we've actually tested this level now for the third time, this breakout zone, and found uh, uh, support on the heart line, which is the midline here in yellow. You can see how this was support here. Then it was support. Then it couldn't be support. It kept breaking down, established above it. And now for almost a week, it's been support again. And now we're looking to break out. Very positive sign. Uh, we do have some bearish divergence in the RSI on the daily time frame, and a little bit on the MACD, but I don't think that that's going to prevail. And I'm getting ready to tell you why I think we're going to go up 29% in a short period of time. So let's go. Bitcoin dominance. This is an important chart. This actually goes back 14 years, or I'm sorry, a decade for this one. And um, what's important about this, you can see this downward trend that goes back seven years, um, all the way to eight in some cases, but you can see how it has multiple touch points. We haven't hit it yet, but I think that's coming very soon. And here's why. If you look down here at the volumes, you can see that we have a massive amount, like one of the fourth highest levels in Bitcoin's history is right here. And it looks like we're slamming up against it and have been for five months. Now, this is important because it looks like an inverse head and shoulder. You can see the left shoulder. You can see the head. You can see the right shoulder. And you can see a bunch of attempts to go higher. I th think that's getting ready to happen. And here's the, here's the thing that might shock you. I don't think we're just going to, the measure move for this is getting close to testing this level up here. And to give you a clear indication, if you don't know what Bitcoin dominance is, it's just the amount of market cap for Bitcoin versus altcoins. And right now it's sitting at about 53.59%. I think that's going to get up into the 58s. And I think it might even cruise up here into the 60% range, breaking out of a downward trend line that's over eight years old. Again, just it's record breaking stuff that I think is getting ready to happen that we've never seen before. And another indication of why this cycle is much more powerful than what we saw the last and even the one before it. And uh, let's let's take a look at some other stuff to see, see if we can validate that thesis. This is from James with Invest Answers. He pointed out, and a few other people have too, that we're seeing the seventh monthly candle of green. That hasn't happened since 2012, 12 years ago. So, and it's getting ready to close here in a few more hours. We're going to see the seventh candle, seventh monthly candle, and we'll see a record for, for that we haven't seen since 2012. If that doesn't speak to the fact that this cycle is different, I don't know what does. So again, whether it's Bitcoin dominance potentially breaking out above here or seven months worth of green candles, we're seeing history here, guys. Also, this is all happening while there's very little retail interest in the markets. Look at this. Look at this. We, we're at levels that we that that are like nothing, nothing for retail interest. Here's my argument. I actually think that the bulk of this has been driven by institutional and existing retail whales that have been involved in this, like the micro strategies. And now, you know, BlackRock with IBIT and all these ETFs coming in. I think that the, the inst I think investors with ETFs are dabbling their toes in this and putting some money into these. But I don't think it's a lot of money. It's not, it's not excited levels of money. And this is a shorter time frame. This only goes back over a year. But let's go back five years. I think that timing wise and just based upon level of interest, these spikes we're seeing here are like this are like 2020 before we got to 2021 where we had our big peaks and blow off top. That's the timing wise. This is where we're at guys right here. And so we're looking forward to this coming. And I would argue that this cycle, this last one was this double top wouldn't have been a double top if the, if the fed wouldn't have raised rates at the most aggressive rate in history, but they did. And so I, I would argue it would have been up here. So we're nowhere guys. We're right over here. We got a long ways worth of interest to go, at least a year, maybe a year and a half of upside, um, maybe maybe less than a year and a half if Bitcoin really explodes the way I think it's going to. Because I actually believe that not only, not only, if you look here, just to give you some indication of this chart too, this is when ETFs took off, this gold vertical right here. 
you can see there's a little bit of a dip then it goes up now we're starting to really go up let me refresh my screen here now we're starting these are some of the computer issues that i'm getting fixed with my mac book so i'm very excited about that and then i'll try and get this desktop fixed as well but my macbook won't have these problems but what i wanted to point out here is that in gosh you can see it right now it wants to blow through this i think i think it at close today we might see more upside but if you look here you can see how not only could we get to ninety two thousand, i believe by the halving or shortly afterwards but i believe by the end of the year we get to one hundred and forty nine thousand, the next fib level after the golden retracement zone the stat 618 right here so yes, I'm I'm making that comment. I think we're getting to 150k this year. I really do believe this. Everything is lining up to do this. And then when you look at the fact that interest isn't that great, you could see how this could be rocket fuel. We're in a holiday weekend, guys and gals. This is the time where people tell their loved ones and their family members about Bitcoin and what how much money they've made and how how this is a great opportunity for others to make it. And so people are hearing this and they're going to start to want to buy on Monday once they're done hanging out with family and or Tuesday. So expect that to happen. This is what happens historically around these times. Now, also more rocket fuel, more rocket fuel. The liquidation level you see up here. So this shows liquidation leverage. It shows where leverage exists. And the brighter these colors get, the more towards like light green to yellow, the more, the greater the chance of liquidation because it means massive volumes are sitting there. So above 72,000, maybe 72,500, we're going to see 1.3 billion, maybe more by now, in liquidated accounts. And that is a huge amount. So the pain trade is usually the one that wins in these markets, right? Not just these markets, but all markets. And so wherever the most amount of leverage exists, that's probably where the market's going to push itself <clears throat> because you could break these and really launch the price higher. Now, if you look lower, there's not a lot of interest. There's not a lot of money to be made if you push this price lower, but there is if it goes higher. So I'm arguing this is rocket fuel for that, <clears throat> that massive increase that I'm looking for towards the dot 618 and that 92,000 level. So again, remember this. Liquidation wants to push us higher. So maybe we see that God candle. Another thing to point out, short-term holders whales, right? This shows in the billions over on the left, realize cap, how after MicroStrategy started to get in, that's when that's when the whale money started to really come in for short-term whales. And it was kind of flat to stagnant for a long time, but then the Bitcoin ETFs, that's right about here, the narrative kicked in and then BlackRock kicked in. And just look at this, look at the short-term uh, whales and, and them holding, look at the increase in this the they're 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 making plays they're making bets right now guys and gals they're making bets and it's to the upside and it's in a big way and you need to think about this so we have record amounts of whales we have record inflows we have some other stuff larry fink i'm going to play a video in a second from larry fink and he's going to talk about his views on on the markets bitcoin and just productivity, AI, robotic, all these things that can increase productivity on top of the fact that he thinks the markets are better than a lot of people do. And I'm just, I got to switch here so I can get the audio um, because just because I'm having all these problems. I got to do it, do it the right way in here. Otherwise it won't work. So hopefully we don't get any lag in the video and everything's good. This is my last attempt. So hopefully it works out. But we're going to listen to Larry's take on this. We're going to do it at 1.5x. Because I want to, I want it to go fast here, or maybe 1.25, because I don't want it to bomb. So let's let's go ahead and give it a go. To some, it looks very much like a bubble, and it has the characteristics of a bubble, not just the S&P, but this entire market. It's getting frothy. It's got what many would say is a compelling story. That would be AI. What kind of meetings are you having at BlackRock about how to invest around what could be a bubble bursting? Well, first of all, I don't think it's a bubble. I think um, we're seeing more validation uh, at, with stock prices. We, we're seeing earnings momentum in a lot of companies. Even today, you cited the Russell. So the Russell 5000 is when that goes up at more, that's start, starting to tell you there's more breath in the marketplace. Um, historically, we looked at some, so much of the gains in seven stocks, but the, actually the breadth of the market is expanding. To me, that gives me a good sign. When I talk to CEOs and businesses. I wanna to talk to this real quick. So market breadth has been expanding for a while. 
uh, months now it's been expanding. Tom Lee was talking about it. But I want to say this, his, his points about the market, I'm bullish too. I've been bullish since December of 2022, listening to Michael Howell from Cross Border Capital talk about how global liquidity was increasing. A lot of people didn't listen to him. There were others that were talking about it too. I did, and that allowed me to make tons of money. I made 700% in gains across my entire portfolio on average last year because I focused on global liquidity and I didn't listen to narratives in the market, narratives that were bullshit, talking about how everything was going to fall apart. You got to remember the banking crisis fear started in March of 2023. There was a lot of fear, a lot of fear, but the technicals and the actual data said that we were going higher. And it did. And now we're seeing market breadth expansion. And all that means is that we're seeing markets pushing out. And let me actually show you. Let me show you this real quick. I'm going to present another screen real fast. One second here. We're going to look at the Russell because I want you to see this. I want you to see what. So he he's going to talk about the, the Russell 2000 and or the 5000 and the expansion. Here's what I want you to see. So going back to April of 2022, right now we're seeing a breakout. We've seen a breakout above the FIB, the first FIB level. And then we saw a back testing of support right here, back testing it, coming up above, bouncing off the 50 and going higher. So we're seeing the Russell want to scream higher. It could go up another 10%. Tom Lee actually believes this thing can go as high, well, somewhere up here, around 3,000. Because he was saying back down here, I think we got a 50% move. So he's saying about the 3,000 level on the, on the Russell is what we could be seeing. And that's a big deal. That's really important. Very exciting. I'm going to go back over here and share the screen again. And we'll listen to the rest of what um, Larry wants to say here. Um, probably 80% of the companies that I'm talking to are, are seeing upward momentum. Leonardo and earnings and stuff like that. Earnings, revenue, growth, margins, productivity is up. Let's be clear, productivity fell during COVID when people were working yeah. from home. People are back in the office, productivity is increasing. Productivity is a good sign for expanding margins. And so, look, we read the newspapers, we listen to television. Real quick, before he gets to this next point, I wanna, I wanna, make, I wanna say something real quick. Productivity isn't just expanding because we're out of the COVID days. Productivity will expand in the years ahead. And even this year, greatly, from chat GPT and AI products, things like Palantir, um, Tesla, full self-driving, 12.33. The car has a mind now. And so we're looking at autonomy. We're looking at AI. We're looking at numerous robotics companies. We're looking at increasing efficiency at a time where we've got more and more retirees leaving the market, which means unemployment gets to stay low because with retirees leaving the market, they need to fill those jobs. And so they're looking around trying to find out how to fill it. So it's going to be hard for unemployment to get really high outside of illegal immigrants that are coming into the country that aren't necessarily counted in some of these numbers. But that can be good, too, because if you let them work, you can also make it to where, again, margin gains for businesses and labor that that might be harder to find. COVID times, man, there's not a lot of people that want to do low ends, you know, shitty labor, especially when they were they were somewhat OK with it when they got 50 percent raises or 30 percent raises. But now that's those times are over and there's jobs that people just don't want to do. So we're looking at the benefit of retirees rolling out and we're looking at the fact that we have cheap access to cheap labor. And um, there's other things, too, that we're going to go into. But let's let let's let Larry finish his thought. But productivity will continue. Productivity will con continue. It's full of negativity. Right. And at the same time, we're having record stock Listen, levels. I love when it goes up, too. But when all assets are going up and I'm talking gold is at an all time high or relatively close to it. Bitcoin, which, of course, you know about because of your iBit ETF. Yes. Uh, all of these assets are just spiking no matter what the news is. I think there's a strong reason for the United States to have more momentum than any place in the world right now. The innovation in technology, the innovation in, in energy stocks in terms of oil discovery and, distract, and extraction. Mm -hmm. So there are many reasons why we're seeing you know, greater productivity and there's really great opportunities. But you know, my letter talked about retirement. OK, right. retirement is not something about whether the market's up or down in any one quarter. Yeah. OK, we, we can't term. we can't be confused. I did want to say before he gets into this retirement part and some of this we might I don't know. I, some of it isn't as pertinent to this conversation, but I do think it's helpful and we'll probably still cover it because it's only an extra minute or two. But what he was talking to with negativity. 
so many people like the Michael Burries of the world called like the last 13 recessions out of the last two. It negativity does not make you money. Okay. You can sound really smart. You can sound really smart when you talk about all the worries of the world. And obviously you get a ton of clicks accounts that aren't optimistic like me and aren't looking towards the problems that are solving uh, issues that are happening now and in the future. Those accounts probably have three to four X as many people behind them. Because people love to be afraid. They love to click on things that are scary and bad. And like, it's it's evident in news. It's evident in social media. It's what gets the clicks. And the incentive is to get the clicks and get the money. But that won't make you money because the majority of the time, there are people that want to solve the problem so that they can keep their jobs, so that they can keep their houses. And 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 these CEOs, like, like the Elon Musk that work to resolve problems, they make the world a better place and they solve massive amounts of issues. You got to realize Elon just yesterday, I think, sent three rockets up into space. One of them dropped somebody off at the space station and then deployed satellites and then landed itself back down to Earth. And then there were two more of these, three in a day. And and yet people doubt his ability to do things with full self-driving. And we're seeing it now. We're seeing that unfold, too. And then he's in the energy market. It's And he's in doing Neuralink, where they're helping people that were paralyzed have lives again and potentially walk in the future. And there's the boring company. And there's trying to go to Mars. And there's, you know, renewable. There's so many things that are happening right now. And this is just one amazing person. Optimus, the robot. This is one amazing person on top of all the others that are trying to solve problems. And the people that solve problems are the ones that will make the money in the future. And the people that support them will make the money in the future. So instead of always focusing on the problems, think about potential solutions and look to who is trying to solve them and who stands the best chance. That's how you make money. It's not by being bearish all the time. It's not by trying to be smart and say the world is falling apart. Anybody in life can talk to problems. Identifying problems is a dime a dozen. My old boss, I won't mention his name, but the CEO of the, this company that I worked at for Urgent Care Software, he used to talk about how, yes, finding problems is good. Knowing where the problems are is good. Knowing the solutions is what matters, though. You can find tons of problems, but the people that can find the solutions, that is where the money is at. So again, just think about that. Think about think about the majority, 90% 90, 90 of the time, the markets are going up, guys. So find the people that are solving problems. News about you know one stock or a market over a quarter. This is a long horizon. And I said, this is a crisis in the world today. It is a crisis because we, we, we're spending so much time today talking about the miracles of medicine. There's not a day that you don't read or hear about the, the new wonders or the CEO. So I'm jumping just a little bit. He was talking about like uh, Ozempic, uh, Manjaro, all these things that are kind of making people to where they live longer and healthier lives. And it, it's arguable on whether or not, whether there'll be further complications from these things. But I do have to say this, that, that, um, we are, we will see people living longer again in the future. Genomics and all the things that I've talked about will make it easier to live longer lives and understand, you know, what, where you might have deficiencies in your genetics and or vitamin levels and all this other stuff in the body where, where we're going to see people living longer. We're going to see more productivity through all the AI autonomy and all these other things. And what he's trying to do is encourage people to invest at younger and younger ages and throughout their lives because we're going to live longer. And I think that's good stuff. Not so much what I'm focused on right now, but again, good stuff. We're skipping it a little bit. You know, the two biggest guys on Wall Street, you know, run the biggest firms, but you're kind of the yin and yang <laughs> of, of predicting the future here. Jamie is very negative. I mean, he thinks the Fed, well, I'm very, but he's significantly I'm pessimistic. Very, but pessimistic. He okay. would say Fed rate hikes are coming more. It's going to, something's going to happen with the economy because of that. You, you, the, I mean, listen, you nailed the Fed rate, rate hike stuff. I, yeah. since, and I think you're going to nail it going forward at least two more. And one in probably, June. probably two more. Why don't you see that having any de deleterious impact on the economy and the markets? Because most of the viewers who own homes, they own homes with a 30-year mortgage. Mm -hmm. They are not impacted by higher rates. And so we, the transmission of high rates in America are much more elongated because the average homeowner is not impacted. In most places in the world, home ownership is, uh, is an adjustable mortgage of some sort, and it resets all the time. So we have the entire mortgage industry 
that's having a th that has a 30 year so mortgage. It, it's sort of cocooned, you're saying, the, the consumer to something. It, it brings down the volatility dramatically and it really gives us that. Two, um, real quickly on that point, back during the 2008 great, great financial crisis, we had an issue with mortgages where we had a lot of mortgages that were adjustable rate, even into the double digits percentages. And so, and there's other parts of the world, Canada, Australia, parts of Europe that have these adjustable rate mortgages where they suffer greatly because their interest rates have went up a lot and the affordability is bad. And it just creates a downward spiral. We have people in the States that are in the twos in their mortgages and on average in the three percentage range, and they're locked in with these 30 year mortgages. So they haven't seen that volatility. Sure. It's been, it's been tough on the uh, real estate market as, if you're a realtor or, you know, uh, home, I wouldn't even say home builders because new homes are still in demand. But if you're in, if you're a realtor, you've been hurt by this or other areas of that sector, or again, an auto where you have people that are buying these loans and they're looking to get new cars and they're like, do I want to pay 7% or do I want to hold on to mine a little bit longer? So, and it, so you, you have these issues um, where, where these sectors are, have been hurt, but all in all, the economy is actually in pretty good shape because again, we don't have two thirds of the, of the country owns real estate. And those people have $43 trillion more in wealth than they had before the pandemic. And so they've been enriched and they don't have the pain of adjustable rate mortgages stealing some of that wealth away from them. That's not a thing. So you got the bottom one third of the country that don't own assets. They've been hurt and they've, they're suffering, right? They've got some pain, but they don't make up the majority of the spending. And, and again, so as long as you're like in a higher end, higher end um, retail environment or you're looking at the broader economy, all these other sectors, they're doing fine. And there's so much money out there. And sure, when rates start to come down, they might want to sift into some long term bonds, some of that money. But there's a ton of money and a ton of wealth that could be tapped against equity as rates come down. And we should see the housing market start to revive and we should see auto start to pick up as people get optimistic about the future. And so there's a ton of wealth out there. Think about that and think about the fact that we're not getting hurt by real estate and the way that other countries around the world are because of the fact that we have these fixed rate mortgages. Um, we, we have corporations that have done a very good job at extending maturities. If you look at the credit markets today, you do not see companies being stretched too right. far. Now, in the, some of the private credit areas, you're seeing more and more small companies. And I think this is the tale of two, two parts of the economy. The, the big, large cap companies that are part of the S&P are, are doing quite so well So they manage overall. their balance sheets well. Um, Absolutely. So the Fed, want to nail you down. Yep. Prediction on the Fed. I think, as I said now for over two years, inflation is going to be stickier. I still believe inflation is going to be stickier, but I do believe the Federal Reserve will have room to test the economy, to test the markets, to, to one, one, well, depending on what happens between now and June, but if everything materializes as we think it will be, they will do an easing in June and maybe one more easing between okay, now and year Okay, you just said end. maybe. I want to point that out. So even, even Larry thinks that Inflation is going to be stickier. I don't. I don't actually totally agree with that. It could happen, um, but I, I believe probably like 65, 35 that it won't be that sticky because we've got countries like China, we've got parts of Europe, we've got some parts of Asia that are seeing a downward in, in Latin America where they're seeing they're seeing pressures on them right now um, from their economies. Again, like real estate, where adjustable rate mortgages are pulling down and uh, and slowdowns in manufacturing and industrial. And, and areas of their economies that are like the big winners, um, especially China. I won't go into all that, but obviously, you know, I've got my opinions about China. So I see I see disinflation coming from all of this in the future. But note that even though he, he believes that inflation will be stickier, he still thinks and agrees with me that rates will come down in June. So if that happens, I think just to test the markets and see how things go, not to do a lot of rate uh, rate uh, reductions, but just to give people hope that that's the direction we're heading in the future, that's a very positive sign. It could help open up real estate market again. People that have been waiting several years now are going to say, hey, the rates just dropped. They're going to drop in the future. That's the signal. Let's go out and buy that house now. It's going to be a little bit cheaper. Maybe with, with points, we can get under 6%. And then later, we'll be able to refinance this thing. I mean, that's probably what I'm going to be doing in a year or so. So I could see that happening a lot. And then I could see the, the auto sector starting to open up a little bit too. 
with rates coming down in the future. And so I think this is going to be a very positive thing. I also wanted to point out, he was talking about commercial real estate and just well, corporations, but I want to talk about corporations and commercial um, uh, real estate. They need to see rates come down. The government needs to see rates come down. Why? Because the government has bonds right now that are turning in their interest on these are turning into the highest portion of the government budget, not military anymore. It's the interest on our payments. The government wants bond rates to be lower so that they don't have to pay you a bunch of interest on the debt. It makes it more sustainable in the long run for our economy and for them running higher debt loads. But not just them. They know they need to help the commercial real estate market. They don't mind if there's some failures, but they don't want the big guys going down. And so they they know they need to provide relief because there's a ton of commercial real estate that already has or is getting ready to mature. And they'll need to push out debts at lower rates or it will be unsustainable and a systemic problem. They don't want this. They also don't want this for corporations that have been able to maintain. A lot of zombie companies have died, and that is good. That's a good thing. We want to clean out zombie companies. But what you don't want to do is have good companies that didn't realize the, the Fed was going to raise rates at the most aggressive rate in history, getting hits like, like banks were getting hit in March of last year. And, and you don't want that to happen. And so the Fed knows it needs to lower rates for its own self-interest and for commercial real estate, CRE, and corporations that need to refinance debts lower. They know all these things need to happen. And so they're going to help try and lower rates as long as they can. They're going to try and lower rates. And that will be stimulative to the economy. And again, I don't think unemployment is going to be an issue. So this is all good stuff. All right. Now, but it's all with maybe. I know. I understand that. But we felt, at least as we look at all of the data, which is still coming in strong for the U.S. economy and the market Absolutely. is doing well, yep. that there may be just one. And Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta I Fed heard, just yeah. came out and said okay. one, one rate cut this year. Maybe. I'm not uncomfortable with that prognostication. I, you know, earlier this year, and I think when the last time I was on the show, there were many people talking about her sixth six. rate cut. And I said, I think on the show it would be no two then. And I'm still saying two. But if I had to be, have a bias, I would say one over three. Right, right. I what assets right. have surprised you? I'm sorry? What assets in the last, let's say, six months and their moves have surprised you? I mean, an obvious one might be the AI-related stocks, big tech, but what else? Actually, in some of those AI stocks, their earnings are actually um, validating. Like NVIDIA's earnings are validating some of its stock price. Now it's trading at a 30 PE, mm -hmm. but and, and, and arguably it was growing faster than that. So let's see how that continues on. Look, I'm, I, I'm very bullish um, on the long-term viability of Bitcoin. I was going to say, did that surprise that you? That surprised me how much that's really? gone up. I mean, look, at it, it, it is, we're, we're creating now a market that has more liquidity, more transparency, and predicted it before we filed it, that we were going to see this type of retail demand. So you thought you'd do good, yeah. but not this good. I thought, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, iBid, if iBid is your ETF yes. over at iShares. Yes. It's about to overtake Grayscale, which was oh, in the yeah. business uh, certainly a lot longer. You look at the gains since January 11th when it first came about. Yes. Have you ever seen this much inflow this quickly into? IBIT is the fastest growing ETF in the history of ETFs. Nothing. In the history of ETFs for the entire planet, IBIT is the fastest growing. Think about that. Again, this is more signal, right? Not only do we have the potential for Bitcoin dominance to break through, uh, trend line that's that's higher than that's that's you know over eight years old. Not only do we have seven months worth of green candles and we haven't seen that in 12 years, not only is short or is interest in Google trends low, and then we have the short interest in front of us waiting to propel, but we have an ETF that has been more successful than any ETF in history. In history. I think it has has gained assets as fast as I've been in the history of ETF. So Ether is next with a, an ETF? We'll see. Uh, that's, uh, that's under registration. Okay, so, so let's uh, just not talk about your product. Right. Talk about Ether. The SEC, there's lots of noise about them declaring Ether a security, which would take it out of the Bitcoin category as a commodity. How does that translate into an ETF? I, I don't think that, look, I really can't talk about it, but I don't think that designation is going to be that deterious to. Oh, really? So yeah. even if it's a security, you can start an ETF, an ETH ETF? I think so, yeah. Oh, that's wild. So we got a financial locomotive heading toward a cliff and that is oh. retirement so you're going oh, to talk cliff. more about yes. that in just a minute uh, as larry said he all right that's the end i wanted to touch on something else that larry had talked about a little bit i'm going to stop sharing the screen here and i'm going to present 
and I'm going to put it back to my window mode. And hopefully all this took, took off. Okay. Um, but again, market breadth expanding all, all the positives that we talked about. Another thing that he mentioned inside of there was energy. And I just wanted to touch upon the fact that oil production in the United States since 2008 has skyrocketed when compared to the rest of the world. Now, don't get me wrong. Saudi Arabia is at new highs. This is the end of 2022. This is even higher now for the United States. So, but this is roughly up here, but this is, this is, this is, this shows that Saudi Arabia was higher. This shows that Iraq was at higher production levels, United Arab Emirates, Norway was, um, Qatar was, all, all of these, all like all of these. And they, again, this doesn't have Russia and some of the others, but for the most part, we've seen production increase. And then we have things where we have EVs and renewable energy, we're subsidizing those sectors to try and push them forward. And they are growing. If you don't believe that you're just wrong. Tesla will just be the, the majority winner, but we will see more battery systems, especially with rates coming down that are industrial scale, commercial scale and residential scale. We'll see more solar deployments. Why? Because if nothing else, the price out of solar from China has dropped by 50% in a year. So once, once rates start to come down, these things become very affordable alternatives. And we're seeing a push towards nuclear. And we're producing more oil than we've ever ever been producing. And record levels. We've reduced our dependency so much, guys. You got to realize this. So not only is this impressive, right? This green candle. But then when you look at U.S. crude oil supply and demand, you can see that since 2020, we've surpassed, again, we surpassed previous levels for our supply. But demand has, is diminishing in the United States. And so, so again, it's all heading in the right direction, which this is just another reason why I believe things aren't as hopeless as everybody makes it out to be with the oil markets and why I think we could see them drop in the future. Also, look at this, crude oil net imports. We've seen a reduction by 75% from what it was for demand, like in 2006, seven range. 75% reduction in our crude oil net imports. So I just want to say, like, it's it's incredibly important to realize how how well markets are doing right now. The opportunity for Bitcoin ahead of us and not even just all that stuff. I want to show something else real quick here. Transaction fees for Bitcoin. This is the second having this blue line. Here's the third. The fourth is getting ready to happen. Look at what this is just transaction fee, not block rewards. Look at what it was before the having event on the second in, in like 2015, 16 or I'm sorry, 2016. Then look at what it was here in July of 2020. Look at what we got up to now. This is just in transaction fees and dollar amounts. Look at how much higher it is now with ordinals and stuff from what than what we saw on these bases right before here at these previous levels. And not even just that, we're also seeing just awesome amounts of growth when you factor in block rewards too. Now, another interesting fact and why I believe miners are going to do even better this cycle than they have recently in previous cycles. If you look at this block, uh, again, the second halving, it took 10 months to, for miners to recover back to their previous values for transaction fees. And the third halving, it took six months. And this one, I think it's going to take three to four. And also before the halving, look at the total fees between transactions and block rewards. And then over here, look at the total fees um, generated. And look at where we are now exponentially. So the difficulty gets harder to increase as with a law of large numbers. And yet the Bitcoin price, yes, it will be harder to increase too, but we've got greater inflows than we've ever experienced before. So again, my argument is that we will see a break up here and we could see that $92,000 range. I've given a bunch of really good reasons for why I think that's going to happen. Um, so again, just it's up to you on what you do with this. Not a financial advisor. I don't have my usual blurbs because I'm using a different tool. Consult a financial advisor. But if they can't speak to all these points intelligently, maybe you need a new one. And uh, I'm going to head back off to Easter here. I've spent a bunch of time trying to make this work. Got to hang out with the kids. And thank you very much, K-Bear, Kayla, for making me this Easter egg, my Bitcoin Easter egg. I really appreciate it. Um, you're a sweetheart. And thank you for helping take care of the little ones today, too. For Easter. And I hope you guys have had a wonderful Easter. I hope you have a great holiday if you're off again tomorrow. Um, thank you for sticking around for this if you made it to the end. And uh, again, I don't think you're bullish enough. I don't think any of us are bullish enough. Um, things are going up.
I hope I, I can't wait to see later this year and do a recap and capture some of these moments. But uh, I, I hope you all prosper and have a great, great rest of your weekend here. And uh, I'll talk to you later, hopefully on a better computer that doesn't bug out. <laughs> Bye, guys.